In this short video, we're going to learn some notation and terminology associated with infinite sets. Now we've seen infinite sets before. Uh, probably the most familiar example is a sequence, right? Maybe the harmonic sequence where we just take the reciprocals of the counting numbers. Or maybe we could look at the powers, integer powers of x, or the sorry, powers of x starting from 0. And suppose now I have a finite set. So let's start by talking about finite sets. We're going to define the cardinality. And we write that cardinality of a set x by putting absolute value signs, or those bars, around x. And that tells us how many elements are in a set. And for a finite set, there's no mystery. It's the number of elements in the set. So the cardinality of a set with n elements is going to be n. Well, what about an infinite set? Uh, that means we have infinitely many elements in the set. And we've seen sets, our uh, natural numbers, uh, so starting with 0, 1, 2, 3, the positive integers after that, uh, that has an infinite number of elements in it. The integers do. And same as the uh, set of rational numbers. And just as a reminder, a rational number is a number that can be written as a ratio of integers. Of course, the denominator can't be 0. And the real numbers. Now note, with all of these sets, they actually form a nested sequence of subsets. Every natural number is an integer, every integer is a rational number, and every rational number is a real number. But there are real numbers which are not rational, there are rational numbers which are not integers, and there's integers which are not natural numbers. And so that would beg the question then, well, how would you define the cardinality of these sets? And would this nested subsetting mean that the cardinality of the natural numbers would be less than the cardinality of the integers, for example? And that's where we have to be very careful. So we're going to rely on the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem that says that if you have two sets for them to have the same cardinality, so if the cardinality of x is the same as the cardinality of y, then there must be a function from x into y, so the domain is x, the codomain is y, and that function has to be both onto and one to one. So we're going to split infinite sets into two groups. The simplest group are what we call countable sets. Countable sets are any, or a countable set is any set which has the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. Uh, this cardinality is so important that we actually assign a symbol to it. It is a Hebrew letter Aleph, and then we put the subscript zero but instead of saying Aleph 0, we say Aleph Null. Uh, and Aleph Null is an example of what we call a transfinite number. Now, countable uh, sets can also be written as a sequence. Let me see if I'm a little bit off with... Uh, no. And because if you think of a sequence, a sequence is really can be viewed as a function whose domain is the natural numbers and whose range are the elements in the sequence. And uh, so it turns out that the integers are countable. We can arrange them in such a way that they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. And we can do the same thing with the rational numbers. So it turns out that, wow, the, even though there are integers, which are not natural numbers, 
the cardinality of the integers is the same as the cardinality of the natural numbers. And even the cardinality of the rational numbers is the same as the cardinality of the natural numbers. So things get a little bit mind-bending when we start talking about infinite sets and transfinite numbers. So our first group is countable sets. The second group is, well, if it's not countable, it's called uncountable. And the set of real numbers is uncountable. That's the claim that we're making. And how could we show that the real numbers, or the set of real numbers, is uncountable? Well, remember that a countable set should be, uh, you should be able to write any countable set as a sequence. So if we can demonstrate that any sequence of real numbers does not contain all of the real numbers, then we've shown that it's impossible to write the real numbers as a sequence. So again, we say if you have any sequence of real numbers, we need to show that it is incomplete. There are, is at least one real number not contained in that sequence. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, oh, give me any sequence, and I can create or construct a real number which cannot possibly belong to that sequence of real numbers. And let's just look at an example. So we're going to take a sequence, uh, and the sequence is just going to be the radical of the um, positive integers, which are not perfect squares. Right? So that's there's an infinite number of those. Those are all real numbers. Uh, we don't have to take irrational numbers. They happen to be irrational numbers. But we don't have to. But we're going to use this sequence of irrational numbers. And we're going to look at their decimal approximation. Now, as a reminder, these are not the values of the number, right? These are decimal approximations. Uh, the decimal representation of radical 2 uh, goes on forever and it never repeats. That's one of the characteristics of an irrational number. But for our demonstration, uh, we're just writing decimal approximations. And again, what is our goal? We want to say that well, here's an example of a sequence of real numbers. We are going to find a number which cannot possibly belong to this sequence. And we're going to use the following procedure. So we're going to look at the nth digit to the right of the decimal point in the nth term of the sequence. So we look in the first decimal place of the first number, the second decimal place, of the second number, the third decimal place, oh, again, always to the right of the decimal point, and so on. And those digits we're going to call d sub n. So in our sequence, d sub 1 is 4, d sub 2 is 3, d sub 3 is 6, and so on. Now we're going to construct a new number y, which cannot possibly be in that sequence. And the way we do it is we're going to define the decimal digits of y using the following rule. If I look at the nth digit to the right of the decimal point of y, it's going to be from our sequence here, d sub n plus 1, if d sub n is less than 9, but if d sub n equals 9, then we're going to have the nth decimal digit of y be 0. So to clarify, our first decimal digit of y would be 4 plus 1, which is 5. And the second decimal digit of y should be what? 3 plus 1, which is 4. And then the third one would be 6 plus 1, which is 7. And then we would have 5 6, 8, 7, and so on. And since this number differs from every number in the sequence in at least one decimal place, then it can't belong to the sequence. 
And since we cannot construct a sequence, there is no sequence which contains all the real numbers, we can conclude that the real numbers are not countable. What about some facts about uncountable sets? Well, here I'll have to be a little bit um, careful. Um, there is um, some question if the cardinality of the real numbers is actually this number, Aleph 1. But for this course, in particular for this video, we're going to take it to be Aleph 1. Uh, the irrational numbers also has the same cardinality uh, and is uncountable. And then if I look at the set of all subsets of real numbers, so finite or infinite, just take all possible subsets of the real number. That's called the power set of R. You can find the power set of any sets, but we're going to find the power set of the real numbers. Uh, its cardinality is even larger than the cardinality of the real numbers, and we're going to call that Aleph 2. So, we have the sense that, uh, and our, even our notation suggests that the cardinality of the real numbers, or the cardinality of an uncountable set, should be greater than the cardinality of a countable set. And to formally express that, we have to say that, well, the cardinality of x will be less than the cardinality of y. If you can find a one-to-one -one function which maps all of x into y, but there's no function which maps x onto y. So certainly, you have a function uh, which, for example, will map the natural numbers into the real numbers, right? Just every natural number is a real number. And so you could just use the identity mapping. But that's not onto, obviously not. Right? So that's, that's not a, a, an onto function. So we have no function which is both one-to-one -one and onto. And then that would say that, oh, the cardinality of x is less than the cardinality of y. Now, how do we write down infinite sets? Well, if we have a countable set, we actually have two choices. We can use the idea of roster notation. So we can kind of write down examples of the entries that follow a pattern and then use these three dots to indicate that the pattern continues. This is what we call roster notation. So this is how we would write the set of all monomials in roster notation. An alternative is to use set builder notation. And in set builder notation, we use something called an index set. So we're going to use capital I to represent the index set. The index set is just a, another infinite set. And for example, if I wanted to write uh, the set of all monomials as the x to the power of n, where n is some natural number, Right. What that means is that for every natural number, we don't leave out any of them. If it's an index set, then for every member of the index set, there is a corresponding member in our set S. So here's some more examples. You could have some even powers of X, and we could just write that as X to the power of 2N, where N is a counting number. Or we could write it out in roster notation. I will use odd powers of x with the same idea. However, we cannot write uncountable sets as a sequence. So roster notation is out for uncountable sets. We have to use set builder notation. And the index set itself is going to be uncountable. So for example, if I wanted to have the set of all exponential functions with base e and the uh, just having a constant times x in the exponent, but the constant could be any possible real number. 
I could write it this way in set builder notation. Now, if I want to look at a finite subset, what I can do is if I have an index set, I'll just put a subscript on the index set. So, for example, if I have an index set i, and i is an infinite set, so I have infinitely many. We don't know if it's countable or uncountable, but I have infinitely many vectors indexed by that index set. And we just want to select four vectors and create a set S prime. Well, then we just put a subscript on the index, or you wind up with double subscript. So we choose four indices, I1, I2, I3, and I4. So our set S prime would be V sub I1, V sub I2, V sub I3, and V sub I4. Here's another example. Suppose that I have our set with an uncountable number of functions, e to the power of kx, where k is any real number. Then we would just put indices on the k. So we'd have k1, k2, k3, up to kn.